Good evening, everyone. I'm Dan Rich, Curator and Director of Education at the Holocaust Museum and Learning Center. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this evening's program. Uh, I want to extend happy holiday greetings to all those who are celebrating at this time, and happy autumn to everyone. Uh, again, I want to welcome you to this evening's program, but I especially want to welcome uh, about 40 teachers from the bi-state area who are part of a workshop that began this evening and will continue through tomorrow. We're very happy that you're here. <laughs> We're about to get word out about our next upcoming program, which will be Tuesday, November 19th at 7 p.m. here in the Kaplan Feldman Building. And at that time, Ellie Rosenbaum, director of the U.S. Department of Justice Office of Special Investigations will discuss his long career hunting Nazi war criminals as well as prosecuting human rights violators and other international criminals. Again, you'll be hearing more about that program, which will be sponsored by Dr. Arthur Gale and family in memory of Marilyn Gale. And now to introduce our speaker, it's my pleasure to call upon Bud Rosenbaum, Chair of the Holocaust Museum and Learning Center. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Let me add my welcome to that of Dan, especially to the teachers who are here this evening. It's our pleasure to welcome you all here to the Holocaust Museum. Uh, I was going to, at this point, mention something about the fact that when we planned this, uh, no one in their wildest dreams thought our competition would be the third game in the national <laughs> But given the circumstance, I'm not going to mention that at all. <laughs> First of all, let me tell you this evening's program is presented by the Gloria and Ruben Feldman Family, Fashion, Family Education Institute. And as always, we thank Gloria and her family for their continuous devotion, leadership, and generosity. Okay, Gloria, a personal thank you as well from all of us. Scott, Scott, Okay. Okay. <laughs> Scott Miller was on the founding staff of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, where he worked for 30 years, most recently serving as the Director of Curatorial Affairs. He now serves as a consultant on special acquisitions for the Holocaust Museum's National Institute of Holocaust Documentation. He is the co-author with Sylvia Ogilvy, excuse me, Sarah Ogilvy of Refuge Denied, the St. Louis Passengers and the Holocaust, the story of their journey for the St. Louis Passengers, published in 2006. Please join me in welcoming to this St. Louis, Dr. Scott Miller. Thank you, but can you all hear me? Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, I echo what Dan said. Happy autumn to everybody. Happy New Year, Shana Tova. 5780 is a great year, better than 5779. Um, and uh, it's, first of all, uh, very uh, thrilling to be here at the Holocaust uh, Museum and uh, Learning Center in St. Louis. It's a wonderful uh, place of Holocaust memory and education, a very, very important place. Um, and I want to thank everyone. I want to thank Gloria. Hi, I had the pleasure of meeting earlier. Thank you for all that you do. And to um, Dan Rich for uh, inviting me here and Lori for, for uh, setting up the PowerPoint. And thank all of you uh, for, for coming. And your next speaker is amazing. Eli Rosenbaum, who's coming on the 19th of November. Uh, uh, talk about Nazi hunting. You have to all come back to, to hear him. So I'm here tonight, though, to uh, talk about an unsolved mystery that hovered over America for about 60 years. And that is, whatever became of the passengers who sailed on the ill-fated voyage of the refugee ship to St. Louis in late May, early June 1939, the unthinkable happened. A ship carrying over 900 Jewish refugees fleeing Nazi Germany for, uh, for their lives, this is only six months after Kristallnacht, were first denied entry 
into Cuba, and then, even more unthinkable, were de denied entry into this country, into the United States, after sailing so tantalizingly close to the shores of Miami Beach that the passengers could see the beach, could see the sand of the beach, and the, and the palm trees, and the hotel lights, and were sent back. That was, that's a relatively famous story. It was headlines at the time, and I see a lot of people in the audience are familiar, at least in broad strokes, with this story. But again, what um, myself and my colleagues at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum were interested in finding out is the mystery, whatever became of the passengers, one by one. Nobody knew. Everyone talked about the St. Louis as a ship that languished off the coast of Miami Beach, which it was, but it was more than a ship. It was 937 passengers. And we at the Holocaust Museum in Washington had some, um, you could say, unfinished business with this story. We wanted to know what happened to the passengers one by one by one for a variety of reasons. Uh, we wanted to show, first of all, that there are individual consequences to a less than generous refugee policy in times of crisis. Um, we also wanted to tell this story because the story of the St. Louis is really the place where Holocaust history and um, American history intersect. The story of the St. Louis is as much about the United States as it is about the Holocaust. And the Holocaust Museum in Washington, being this country's national memorial, located right off the mall in Washington, was the fitting place uh, to tell this story. Um, and we also wanted to tell this to find out what happened to the passengers. It was simply the thrill of the chase, the challenge. Could we find out what happened to all 937 passengers? And I have to say, when we began this project in the 1990s, which is when we did it, um, most of it, uh, we never dreamt at that moment how relevant this story about refugees trying to get into this country would be. Um, we'll leave it at that. Maybe it can come up later during Q&A. But we never, for sometimes you don't want things to be so relevant. But this ended up being a much more relevant story um, than we even imagined in the 1990s. So um, first of all, just to review the story of the St. Louis, and then I'm going to talk about the search. Uh, the St. Louis set sail from um, Germany from Hamburg, May 13, 1939, carrying 937 passengers, almost all of them uh, uh, Jews. And when the passengers set sail, and there's a photo here that you could see of, a pa of uh, passengers boarding the ship. As you can see, it was part of the Hamburg America line. It was a cruise ship. The passengers paid for their uh, affair. And Remember I said a few minutes ago that the St. Louis took place just six months after Kristallnacht. So, I don't know if you know, but Kristallnacht was actually the first time that Jewish men systematically were deported, not to death camps like Auschwitz in Poland, but they were in, deported to concentration camps, or internment camps in Germany, Buchenwald, Dachau, Sachsenhausen. And ironically, they could be released, and they were released from this camp, these camps, if family members could show they had a ticket to leave Germany. It was this window where Jews could get out, and uh, over a hundred of the men who were on the St. Louis were actually, had already been interned in Dachau, Sachsenhausen, and their families got the tickets on the St. Louis. And at this point, Jews were clamoring to go anywhere in the world to get out of Germany. There were Jews who ended up, you know, in, in, in Asia, in South America, in New Zealand. So the Hamburg America line, the, the St. Louis was sailing to Cuba, and they were the envy of everybody because Cuba is only an hour from the United States. Um, America at that time had very tight uh, um, uh, restrictions on immigration. The year of the St. Louis, um, uh, there were only 27,500 visas given to German Jews to come to the United States. And by the time that St. Louis set sail in May, the 27,500 were already taken. So you got what was called a waiting number to get into the United States. And again, German Jews took these waiting numbers all over the world. So those on the St. Louis were really considered lucky because once their waiting number came up, they'd be so close to the United States. And those days, you can go much easier between Cuba and the United States than you can today. So don't even think today was very easy. They were really the envy of everybody. So the St. Louis set sail May 13, 1939. It was bittersweet for the passengers. It was sweet because they were getting out of Germany, but it was also bitter because they were leaving Germany. Most of the St. Louis passengers were German Jews. They thought of themselves as Germans and they were leaving their home where their families had been for hundreds of years. So that's why I say it was bittersweet. But for the kids on board the St. Louis, it was the time of their life. First of all, this was the first time they could run around and play free since 1933. Since Hitler came to power, um, 
she was children where you could not go to playgrounds or to public parks. So here they they had you know there was a there was shuffleboard, there was a pool. The kids had the time of their lives. And the uh, little boy, the second from the left, his name is Herbie. Um, Herbie always said when the St. Louis got to Miami Beach, he said it looked so beautiful that you could imagine. And he said if he if he ever survived, he'd come back and live in Miami Beach. Herbie today is 91 and he lives in Miami Beach. Uh, so it's one of the happier stories. A number of those kids, though, that you see there were ended up um, uh, at Auschwitz. And it wasn't just for kids. Uh, there were parties for the adults. Um, and also there was like even things you don't think about, but there was a hairdresser for women on the St. Louis. Um, Jewish women couldn't go to hairdressers in you know the cities they lived in. So here, this was really a real flight uh, to freedom. But oh, and there was also um, you know uh, all types of sports and recreation on board the ship. But two weeks later, on May 27th, 1939, the St. Louis arrives at the port of Havana, and you can imagine the anticipation and how beautiful Havana looked, also with palm trees. And passengers got up very early this morning, that morning, and had breakfast. And they are then greeted by um, Cuban uh, uh, police in boats. They weren't told they couldn't get off. They just were told one word. Every single those passenger who survived tells me this. They learned their first Spanish word. Then was mañana. They were told tomorrow they could get off. Mm -hmm. But as one passenger said, there was no mañana. Mañana never came. And what happened was only 28 passengers were allowed to get off the uh, St. Louis. And those were um, passengers who had not just landing permits land in Cuba, but actually bought for the, uh, $500, which then was a lot of money, actual visas that were signed by the Cuban Secretary of Treasury and, um, um, and, and labor. And they were more kosher than uh, landing permits. So 22 Jewish passengers were able to get off. And, uh, but the rest were on board. There was chaos on board. Many of the St. Louis passengers actually had um, relatives in the United States who flew down to Cuba thinking they were going to greet them. And uh, that's not what happened. Instead, the passenger, the relatives of the St. Louis passengers were able to rent these little boats and they sailed out to the uh, St. Louis and were able to wave. They came within a few yards of the passengers and were able to wave, but um, not touch, not get on board. So here's a mirror image. Those are the St. Louis passengers looking out at their relatives on these small uh, ships. And um, it was absolutely heartbreaking. And by the way, among the um, uh, people who went uh, down to, um, to uh, Cuba were relatives of a uh, 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 husband and wife on the St. Louis named uh, uh, Leon, Leon and Johanna Joel. And they are the, actually the great aunt and uncle of Billy Joel. Mm -hmm. Billy Joel's great aunt and uncle were on the St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, Billy Joel's father, who was a refugee, was in, living in Cuba at the time. And he talks about going also, he was at the port also, among the people waiting for <laughs> Billy Joel's father. And Billy Joel's great aunt and uncle ended up being deported to Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. uh, they were not among the uh, uh, fortunate survivors. Uh, so. The joint distribution tried to broker a deal with the Cuban government to let in the passengers. To this day, we don't know the exact reason why Cuba did not allow in the St. Louis passengers. Um, we know that Cuba, a small island, had a relatively generous refugee policy, and um, there were had there had been a massive uh, anti-immigrant, pro-fascist. Uh, uh, protests the week of the St. Louis. The St. Louis was a very large ship. It was close to a thousand passengers. Most of the refugee ships coming to Cuba had a hundred or two hundred passengers. So the St. Louis's arrival got a lot of attention. Uh, there was also a corrupt Cuban um, consular official named Manuel Benitez in Germany who was selling landing permits to the uh, German Jews for a lot of money and pocketing the money. And he was corrupt and there's a theory that of many historians that unfortunately the St. Louis passengers fell uh, prey to the infighting in the Cuban government. That the Cuban government was punishing Benitez by saying, we know what you're doing, you can't, we're not gonna honor your, uh, your passes. In any case, they were not allowed to land in Cuba. I was down, I did research in the Cuban National Archives in the, um, in the year 2000, and um, 
they had files on all the ships that came to Cuba. The St. Louis file was somehow missing, that's what we were told. So to this end, we don't know exactly why Cuba did not let them in, but most of our attention as Americans is really on the United States. Why didn't America let them in? So the captain, Captain Schroeder, who was a German, uh, but who was really devoted to the passengers. In fact, on board the ship, on the way over to Cuba, Captain Schroeder told his crew, most of whom were members of the Nazi party, that these passengers are to be treated like any other Germans. They bought their tickets and they're to be treated like any other Germans. And to hear a sentence like that publicly since 1933, when Hitler's power was unheard of in Germany, and in fact, Captain Schroeder, every Friday afternoon, gave the ballroom uh, for Kabbalat Shabbat to have uh, services for the passengers and he ordered that the portraits of Hitler and the swastikas be taken down for Shabbat for 24 hours. He was a really uh, righteous person. He was committed to finding haven for the St. Louis passengers. So he sailed slowly to the coast of Miami Beach. There was a belief that America would let in the St. Louis passengers, one because it's America, the country of the Statue of Liberty, but also based on the more technical bureaucratic reasoning that most of the St. Louis passengers had waiting numbers to get to the United States. It was just a matter of letting them in early. So they're not even what today people refer to as boat people. They were people on a boat, but they were not boat people. They were people with paperwork to get into the United States. It was a matter of letting them in a little early. Cables were sent from the ship to uh, President Roosevelt and to the State Department asking for entry for the passengers. As far as we know, the cable from the White House was never answer, but the State Department did answer the head of the uh, visa division, saying that the St. Louis passengers would have to wait their turn until the numbers came up. You can imagine what this life was like. They just left Germany and now they're right off the coast of Miami Beach. And maybe later during question and answer, I'm sure many of you have questions about, well, why didn't America uh, let them in? And I think many people here are familiar with the answers in terms of um, the, the xenophobia and anti-Semitism that was at its height in American history at that time in America. America was in a uh, uh, depression. Um, there was certainly no political benefit for Roosevelt to let in the passengers. Uh, remember, in, the St. Louis happened in 1939, which ends in a nine. That means the next year ends in a zero is an election year. You don't get elected president four times for being a bad politician. You're a good politician. Roosevelt had the, the Jewish vote in any case. Uh, had, the, had the Americans let in the St. Louis, it might have encouraged other ships to, um, to do the same, just come to America before people had waiting numbers. Uh, there may have been a lot of negative effects, so while it certainly was not courageous of President Roosevelt not to let in the St. Louis passengers, one could say, maybe, one could say, in terms of the context of the time, given the anti-Semitism and the economy, it was understandable, maybe, but certainly not, not uh, courageous. We can talk maybe perhaps more about that later. So um, the St. Louis had to sail back to Europe, presumably to Germany. You could imagine that there was mass panic on board the ship. There were rumors of mass suicide. Um, but Captain Schroeder stayed in touch with the Joint Distribution Committee, the JDC or the Joint as it's called, that still exists today, doing wonderful things in the world. The JDC were really, at the time, at least the unsung heroes, because the JDC brokered a deal with four Western European countries other than Germany to take in the St. Louis, Fran to take in the passengers, France, Belgium, Holland, and England. So on June 17th, the St. Louis did not have to land in, um, in Hamburg, where it set sail from, but rather in, uh, in Antwerp. And from there, the passengers were divided between those four countries that I just said. And at that time, that was considered the happy ending to the story. But we know from history, which is hindsight's always 2020, we know that three out of those four countries, Belgium, France, and Holland, were invaded by the Nazis in mid-1940. So to be a Jew in any one of those countries in 1940 was the same as being a Jew in Germany. So the St. Louis passengers, you could say, were double-crossed. They both, they were, they both, they literally double-crossed the ocean, and they were double-crossed. They thought they were going to freedom, and they end up back under the clutches uh, of the Nazis. So again, the story I just told you now was the famous story. Fast forward to the 1990s, we want to know what happened to these people. A lot of people know individual passengers who were on the St. Louis, um, and in fact, tonight was Francesca, her uh, family member, Egon Salman, who's a friend of mine, who's in his 90s, was on the St. Louis. Everywhere I go, I meet people who know uh, uh, people who are on the St. Louis, amazing, amazing uh, human being, who was in, his family was in Belgium, and they were 
Fortunately, their waiting number came up on the earlier side. We're able to go and settle in New York City. Um, but no one ever knew, as a collective, what happened to the story, what happened to the passengers. So the first thing we did, and I have to remind everyone in this room, this was the dark ages of the 1990s, before social media or internet, or even part of email as we know it today. Just want to remind you. Um, so no, I would have thought to go to Facebook if that's what you were thinking, but it didn't exist. The very first thing, fortunately, at the Holocaust Museum, we did have a, um, we had a number of passenger um, manifest, so we knew the name of every passenger, um, we knew their age, and we knew what country they had been sent to. This was a list prepared by the Joint Distribution Committee. Not that much information, but at least it was uh, a start. And so after this, what we did, we went, uh, maybe some of you have done research at the uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington, and I know here, I think you have some of the same uh, books and documents. There are uh, lists of deportations, the deportation lists from France, Belgium, and Holland. And we were able to find, within a very short time, the name of over 200 passengers who were on the St. Louis who were deported to Auschwitz and Sobibor. And though intellectually we, know, we, we knew we would find those names, uh, on board uh, in these lists, it still was like it hit you in the heart to see someone who you knew was off the coast of Miami Beach, of all places, just a few years before, and then you see their name as being deported to Auschwitz or to Sobibor. And uh, here is, by the way, um, a, a family, the Dublon family, an entire family who ended up um, in Belgium during the war and then deported to Auschwitz. Uh, their two brothers, Willie and Ernie uh, Dublon, and their uh, extended families, and you know they were taking photos on the St. Louis. Look, they were, they were going to freedom. They were on a nice ship and they were going to freedom. You see that little girl, Lori? The Lori's a little girl like in the middle. Um, so that is a class party of Lori's from Erfurt, Germany. She's the girl sitting down with the bow at the left. This was actually sent to us by her childhood sweetheart from Erfurt, who ended up who lives in, actually in Malibu in California. He came to the United States and he knew we were doing this project. So these are, you know, heartbreaking photos. It's people enjoying life, they're on a ship to freedom, and we know, um, you know, what, what happened to them. So after um, looking at the uh, uh, deportation list at the Holocaust Museum, we walked across the mall in Washington to the National Archives and started looking at American immigration records and shipping records. And um, at that point, um, we were able to find happily immigration information, the shipping list of passengers who were on the St. Louis who at some point during the war, obviously their waiting number came up, or after the war were able to come to these shores. So when we added up the um, names of St. Louis passengers we found on the death list, on the deportation list, with those we found on the immigration list at the Library of Congress, we thought it would come to something approaching 937, which was the number of passengers on the St. Louis, but we were close to 300 short. That simple formula to just did not work. And we realized at that point that we could not just be dependent on documents. Until that point, we were dependent on documents to tell us what happened to the St. Louis passengers. Instead of documents, we started to look for people to tell us what happened to the missing St. Louis passengers. Uh, we knew there were people out there throughout the world who could tell us what happened to the unaccounted for St. Louis passengers. It was just a matter of finding them. And again, when I speak to um, high school kids, and I ask, you know, and I, and I say, if you want to get information about somebody from 60 years ago, you want to reach as many people as possible very quickly, what do you do? And so, of course, I say, you know, go, go on Facebook, did you Google them, this, that, you know, and um, Instagram, and I have to tell these students in the dark ages, as I said, of the 1990s, none of this existed. And, um, I often wonder what the project would be like if I did it today, but I have to say that social media is great, usually, but it does not replace traditional research. We would not have found everybody. Um, so when we, the, so the first thing that we did to find out what happened to the missing St. Louis passengers is that we went, in the absence of any social media, we went to what, what I call real media, which is newspapers and radio and television. That's what Holocaust survivors did after the war, especially radio and newspapers, to look for missing people. We put ads in newspapers around the world that were in search of the following missing St. Louis passengers. We were on the radio. Uh, we were even on television. The Holocaust Museum sent me to media training at a very fancy um, PR firm on K Street in Washington. It was a big failure because they kept telling me, don't talk with your hands. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so 
study? We started in terms of. Your mic, your mic, your mic, your mic, your mic turned off. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? No. no. Can we get this one to work? It's a dark age. <laughs> Is there something that I talk with my hands that I push them? <laughs> Our technician. Oh, Lord, it's great. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lori is our close. If anybody remembers 24. Lori's here. <clears throat> Should I wait or try to talk loud? No. Uh, okay, she'll be here in a second. So, um, we, um, the first thing we did, decided to put ads in newspapers. And um, the very first newspaper we, in which we put an ad, remember ads were very, you know, it cost a lot of money, we printed it in a small German language newspaper in, that's published in Tel Aviv uh, called Israel Nachricht, in the uh, Israel News or the German News. Why, in, why there? Well, first of all, why is there a German language newspaper published in Tel Aviv? Because it's a large German Jewish immigrant population that went to Tel Aviv and Haifa, to the large cities over the years. And uh, this is primarily a German-Jewish saga. And I, you know, again, had no background in media. I was a, a documents person, an uh, archives person, a library person. And we, we put an ad uh, in this newspaper, Israel Nachrichten, that was in German, Hebrew, and English. And the ad said, um, that word? No. And, okay, so I'm speaking right now. <laughs> you can find more, it's better, but. Okay, now, you, now you're in the area of just pushing buttons and seeing if anything will work. Hold that button on the microphone. Push on the microphone. Well, we'll just have to be quiet until we find somebody to uh, and, and listen very closely until we get somebody to fix it. There's not a switch that might have been accidentally. I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I, I, I really don't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> there, yeah, batteries. Batteries. Uh, here's I kept saying Okay. Thank you, Okay, so we put this ad. Is there people who didn't hear me? No, we heard Okay, so we put this ad in Israel Nachmished in, in German, English, and Hebrew, saying the Holocaust Museum in Washington is looking for information uh, on the following unaccounted for passengers of the ship to St. Louis. It listed all the passengers. And um, among the passengers on that list, by the way, were a family of three. A father named Manfred Fink, a mother named Hertha Fink, and they had a five-year-old little boy named Michael Fink. And we had a paper trail of evidence showing that the Fink family, when they were sent back to Europe on the St. Louis, were in Holland. And in Holland, they were interned in a camp called Westerbork. From Westerbork, they were deported to Theresienstadt. We had all those documents, and then our clues ended cold. And we had no idea what happened to the Fink family, especially because a five-year-old boy, Michael Fink, most of the kids were older, as you saw in that photo. They were like 11 or 12. Uh, he was like five, whatever happened to Michael Fink. And I get to work the day that the ad is published in Israel Nachrich. And I'm not, I didn't even know it was being published. I, because this wasn't my, you know, uh, I didn't think that much of it. I was very dubious. And I'm going through emails, and I see um, uh, the following email. It says, Dear Mr. Miller, my name today is Mikhail Barak. But in 1939, on board the St. Louis, my name was Michael Fink. I was five years old. I think you're looking for me. I live in Ramada Sharon, it's a suburb of Tel Aviv. And I, I mean, I couldn't 
wow, like I couldn't believe, my first reaction was this works, this really works, this old fashioned media putting names in, in newspapers. So um, I call him on the phone right away and he said he was expecting my call and he um, I just want to tell you something, Mr. Miller, my mother died six months ago, she survived, and she would have been the one that had the memory, he was a little boy, and, but he goes, but my father died literally from an illness, from disease, being put on a cattle cart to Auschwitz, and he eluded documentation, but that's how he died, and he said, my father was off the coast of Miami Beach, how is it that he died on a cattle cart to Auschwitz? And it was a question, that there's no answer, certainly no good answer, and um, so what he told me was, uh, by the end of the war already, he was like 11, and he said after the war, uh, first his mother sent him and then she joined him. She sent him to Palestine, that was then under British blockade, and he went on a ship that was part of Ali Akbar, which is clandestine immigration. Illegal, I say illegal in quotes, clandestine immigration. Um, and he said that's why there was no record. Uh, you couldn't find me after the war because I was living clandestinely, trying to get into Palestine. And then when we got to Palestine and to Israel, we Hebraicized the name from Barak, from Fink to Barak. So he said, Michael Fink hasn't existed since 1948, only Mikhail Barak. And again, that sort of put the whole question of, you know, people change their names, people have hidden identities, people, people's names did not appear on lists because they were doing something clandestine. Anyway, we, uh, I visited Mikhail Barak in his home several times over the years in Ramat Asharon. Uh, I was sad to hear that he just died two weeks ago. Um, he's a very, very um, uh, good friend, and he had a great sense of humor. He would always say he tried to find out um, what happened to other St. Louis passengers who may have gone to Israel, and he spent hours and hours at the uh, Israeli Interior Ministry. I don't know if any of you have ever uh, been there, it's quite a, a scene, so he, he said it would have been a lot easier for America just to let in the passengers and try to find them at the Interior Ministry. Uh, anyway, he was funny, but he was also, uh, had a sense of humor, but he was also, of course, uh, uh, quite bitter. And he sent us this photo, which is really his only memory of his father. That was actually taken at the Westerport camp. And they obviously dressed up for this photo, as if they knew it might be the last photo. That's Michael in the middle, obviously, um, and his parents. And um, I'm going to tell you one more media story. Um, and this involves not television, but or not um, radio, excuse me, not newspaper, but actually radio. And I always enjoyed being on radio more than television because no one could see you, so you could talk <laughs> with, with, you know, with your hand. So we were on NPR, and um, we, were, we were interviewed by Scott Simon on NPR, and we were asked uh, to tell the story of just one St. Louis passenger we were looking for. And I don't know how we just choose, we chose one. There were a few hundred at the time. And we chose a passenger whose name was Rudy Dingfelder who was on the St. Louis with his pa uh, parents, uh, Johanna and Leopold Dingfelder. They were from Plauen, Germany. They ended up, like the Finks, in the Netherlands, were at Westerbork, and were deported to Auschwitz as a family. His parents were gassed upon arrival, but we thought maybe there's a chance that Rudy survived because he was not gassed upon arrival. We only know that because we found his name uh, in a list of forced laborers at Auschwitz. He was working at Auschwitz as a tool maker. So maybe he survived. Most of the forced laborers died, but maybe uh, he survived. And we're telling this story on the radio, and we get a call from somebody in El Paso, Texas, saying, I don't really know if I can help you, because my wife had a relative who, who I knew. He died a long time ago, but he always said he survived at Auschwitz as a tool maker, mm. and I'm going to have to you know, get more information. We'll call you back. And I have to say, we said thank you very much and didn't think much of it, because for every lead that we got about a St. Louis passenger, we'd get like 10 false leads. So, but the guys, this guy's wife called us back and said, look, I had a relative in Detroit who was a survivor of Auschwitz. He survived as a tool maker, but his name wasn't Rudy Dingfelder. I only knew him by his American name. His name was Robert Felder, his uncle Bob. And, um, but Robert Felder was no longer alive, but his widow was alive, Jerry Felder, Geraldine Felder. And she gave us the phone number and we called uh, Mrs. Felder. And uh, I said, you know, this is Scott Miller. I'm calling from the Holocaust Museum. And I said, was your husband Robert Felder? 
And she said, yes, he was. And I said, was he also Rudy Dingfelter who tried to come to America the first time on the St. Louis? And she said, yes, that was my husband. Oh. Incredible. You know, I mean, this was really incredible. We're so thankful to this lovely salt of the earth person who heard us on NPR while driving his car in uh, Texas. So we always, she said Rudy didn't talk much about, it was so painful for him and he lost his whole family. Obviously he lost his parents. And I said, did he ever tell you the circumstances of his survival? It's phenomenal to be an Auschwitz survivor. And she said, two things happened. One was luck and one was his ingenuity. When they arrived at Auschwitz and the camp guards were there and they opened the doors and they flung the passengers off the train, she said, Rudy, my husband, she said, he wore glasses, he had terrible eyesight. But because he was flung off the train, his glasses went flying. He was a 15-year-old boy at the time. And because of the stereotype that if you wear glasses, you're weaker, every teenage boy with glasses was sent to the line to be gassed, and everyone without glasses was sent to the line for forced labor. Mm -hmm. And he, he always believed that saved his life because his glasses went flying. And then when he registered for forced labor, you had to show that you would be productive. They asked, do you have a profession? And he had the presence of mind, not to say what his family business was. His father was a kosher butcher and plow in Germany. Yeah. He had the presence of mind to have a tool maker. And he survived in Auschwitz as a tool maker. And he eventually, after the war, came to the United States. First settled in Detroit, first worked as a tool maker, and then went to college and graduate school. He was an engineer and lived out a real American dream, immigrant mm -hmm. existence in the United States. And we have this photo of the Dingfelders boarding the St. Louis. That's Rudy in the middle, seen with his glasses, um, at, uh, uh, boarding the St. Louis. And we also have from the family uh, this very important I'd say it's an artifact that might look just like a napkin. It is a napkin, but what it is is when the Dingfelders were sent back to Antwerp on the St. Louis, when they disembarked at Antwerp, there were um, officials there from like Hebrew, High S, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, and different Jewish societies assigning the St. Louis passengers very quickly to different countries. And we don't know exactly why certain passengers were sent to which country. Um, but he, you could see, so Leopold Dingfelder, Rudy's father, took a napkin, he didn't even have a piece of paper, he didn't know English, he wrote in German, asking, he writes his name Leopold Dingfelder, and he's asking if he could uh, be reunited with his brother. If you look at the fourth line, Carl J. Felder, us Cleveland, Ohio. If I could go to my brother in Cleveland, Ohio, who's waiting for me in England, could I please be sent to England so I can go with him to Cleveland? And their, their plea, it wasn't heated, they ended up going to Holland and they were deported to uh, Auschwitz. But this is an artifact that tells a very important story about someone trying to, to rescue themselves and rescue their families. And by the way, it's interesting, a lot of St. Louis passengers say they didn't want to go to England, which obviously was the safest of the countries, although there were some St. Louis passengers who were killed in the Blitzkrieg in London, and the, the, also the British government, by the way, interned many of the St. Louis passengers because they were considered to be German and enemy aliens. So it wasn't that it was great in England, but it was clearly the safest place to go. A lot of St. Louis passengers say, oh, my parents didn't want to go to England because we didn't know a word of English. They knew French, or the Dutch was close to German, and they didn't, they, and they didn't want to go to England. Anyway, um, you know, the vagaries of faith, and um, it's just another media story, how we use the media to find out um, what happened to the passengers. And by the way, uh, we had articles in over 120 newspapers, and at one point, we were contacted by somebody, because uh, one of the names of the unaccounted for passengers was a woman named Johanna Jordan. And somebody uh, contacted us and said, you know, Johanna Jordan had a daughter in St. Louis, Missouri. I knew her show. I don't know what happened to her, but she always wanted to go to St. Louis, Missouri. And then we found a, uh, a text from uh, the Immigration and Naturalization Service. We went through their records. And it said that Johanna Jordan, who was on the St. Louis, requested to go to St. Uh, St. Louis, Missouri, where she had a daughter. Her name was, her daughter's name was Ilsa Mansbacher, who was married to Dr. Kurt Mansbacher, and they lived on 4961 Laclede Avenue, if I pronounce that correctly. And it turns out that uh, Johanna did survive, and she ended up here in St. Louis. She died many years ago. We never met her. So people really from all over the country, including St. Louis, were in contact uh, with us. So anyway, um, which time? Okay, go ahead. I make up a few minutes for when the thing was out? Okay. <laughs> uh, so, quick. so um, in addition to uh, 
I don't want you to think we just used the media and we found everyone. It wasn't quite uh, that easy or that um, uh, glamorous. Uh, we also went back to the neighborhoods that the St. Louis passengers lived in Belgium, in, in Brussels, in Antwerp, in Paris. We retraced their steps during the war. And this is a, a St. Louis family actually in uh, Brussels, uh, in the old Jewish neighborhoods of uh, Saarbrück and Anderlecht. They were the old refugee neighborhoods. And we even knew the addresses that they lived in those neighborhoods because the Gestapo took a census of the Jewish population. So we knew their addresses. So we went to that, those neighborhoods, which today are still refugee neighborhoods, but no longer Jewish refugee neighborhoods. They're mainly um, refugees from Muslim countries. And it's very colorful there. There's like a shuk. And, and uh, people were very nice. But the point is nobody could help us trace what happened to people who were there 60 years earlier. And at that point, we realized you know, that the story of Jewish history of the 20th century is not so much where Jews are from, it's where they went to. Um, the places where they were from, unfortunately, were more or less wiped out, but it's where they went to. So we re re redirected our search to Israel and to the United States, the two centers of world Jewry. I'm going to I'll focus this evening um, on the United States. I'm going to start with New York City, the city uh, where more Holocaust survivors settled than anywhere else in the United States, also the city that um, I am from, where I grew up. and. Um, so what did we do in New York City? We went to the New York Public Library and looked at old telephone books. So again, something I have to explain when I speak to kids, what a telephone book is. So they're actual books, big, big books, and that had listed everybody. So we looked at Manhattan telephone books in the 1940s and 1950s and immediately found the names of many St. Louis passengers. We didn't know if they were the same people. A telephone book just tells you the name and their addresses and phone numbers. But I noticed something about there was a pattern in all the addresses of people whose names were Saint, matched those of St. Louis passengers, which were German Jewish names. All the addresses were like in around a, a 40 block radius from about 170th Street on the upper, upper west side to around 210th Street. So if there are any New Yorkers in this room, you know that's the neighborhood of Washington Heights. And Washington Heights, and for me as a New Yorker, this was the, the, the moment of epiphany for the of the entire project of searching for the St. Louis passengers because I never thought to look in Washington Heights. I grew up not far from Washington Heights. Washington Heights was the center of German Jewry, even beginning during the war, but certainly after the war. It was the largest German diaspora city anywhere, uh, neighborhood anywhere in the world, so much so that after the war, people referred to it as Frankfurt on the Hudson, they called it the Fourth Reich, and many, many, many prominent German Jews grew up in Washington Heights. Uh, Henry Kissinger, who by the way was related by marriage to a St. Louis passenger. Uh, Max Frankel, the New York Times, grew up in Washington Heights. Ted Koppel was a refugee child. He was born in England on the way from Germany, grew up in Washington Heights, and perhaps the most famous German Jew in the world lives in Washington Heights today, still, and that's Dr. Ruth, Ruth Westheimer. She still lives in Washington Heights, and she was related by one of her husbands to a St. Louis passenger also, by the way. Uh, so I looked at these addresses, I said, that's it. I remember going to Washington Heights as a kid, visiting my friend's grandparents who were from Germany. I got on the uh, A train all the way up, to, got off at 181st Street, New York Public Library is down on 42nd Street, and I get out, and I realize right away that, yes, like, sort of like Brussels, still a refugee neighborhood, but no longer a German-Jewish refugee neighborhood. It's primarily a Dominican neighborhood. I walked around, and I still saw synagogues that were there. I didn't know if they were in operation, but they were there. The buildings were there. And I went to the, I knocked on the door, but it was during the week of the first one I saw, which was called Share HaTikva, Gates of Hope. And it was called Share HaTikva, Gates of Hope, because it was the first refugee synagogue founded already in 33, right after Hitler came to power. And an old man, uh, wearing a kippah holding a hammer came to the door and I just yelled that I, I'm Jewish, I work at the Holocaust Museum, can you help me? And I explained what my project is and members of the synagogue, were all of whom were German Jewish survivors themselves, got up on a ladder and took out an old membership records from the synagogue that were written, they were in shoe boxes, written in pencil on index cards to see if any names match those of St. Louis passengers or relatives, uh, maybe they uh, once settled in Washington Heights and died, and the relatives are paying for perpetual care of the graves. There are many ways to, to find out. And I have to tell you, first of all, there were, around, there were, this was in the 90s, seven synagogues left in Washington Heights. It had been over 30 at one point. Uh, they were very helpful in finding 
helping us locate either St. Louis passengers who over the years had settled in Washington Heights or their children or relatives in Washington Heights. But when you look at these old membership records from these synagogues, it's very clear you're in the synagogue of Holocaust survivors. I mean, everyone in this synagogue, of the synagogues of Washington Heights were survivors because, you know, when you join a synagogue, you're asked to give yard sites, the dates that relatives died, so the synagogue will remind you to say Kaddish. So here on the membership record, when it says yard site, question mark Auschwitz, question mark Berlin, question mark Civil War, every single one. The pain was palpable of the membership just from looking at these synagogue records. But anyway, using this, uh, the synagogue records, we were able to, first of all, in the 1990s, there were around 15 St. Louis passengers still living in Washington Heights that we found right away. And we certainly found a lot of their um, relatives, people paying for perpetual care of the grave, of their graves. We're very thankful to the synagogues of Washington Heights and also to Self Help, which is a social service agency for Holocaust survivors, and really went out of their way to help us try to locate um, survivors. It was real neighborhood grassroots research, this little treasure of German Jewry in northern Manhattan, right across the George Washington. And uh, one of the incredible people we found was a woman, Elsa Marcus. She's a woman second from the left. Uh, this was in the 1990s, and then she was around 92 years old. So she was on the St. Louis with her parents, her cousin, and her newlywed husband, her newlywed husband, Kurt. And they joked this was our, our honeymoon cruise to Havana. And anyway, they were sent to Belgium. She was the only one to survive. They were in hiding, and they were betrayed by a neighbor, and they were all, uh, her husband was sent to Majdanek, Ilsa, and the rest of her family were sent to Auschwitz. They were all killed except Ilsa, and I asked Ilsa how did she survive, she's a very feisty woman, and she said, I worked in a munitions factory, and I made um, hand grenades. She goes, I booby trapped them, so they go off on, when people touch them, so when the German soldier touched them, they, they go off on contact, so when the German soldier touched them, they blow up in their face. That's what she told me, she was an incredible woman, and she said she worked, she was still working in her 90s because she had to occupy herself, otherwise she'd keep thinking, what happened, what happened, uh, what happened. So again, she was one of the incredible people we met um, in Washington Heights. Um, I did go to the cemetery where most of the uh, Washington Heights synagogues have their burial plots, which is actually in New Jersey. It's Bethel Cedarhurst Cemetery in Paramus, New Jersey. And um, I found, it's ironic, but graves in America are signs of survival, that they survived the war. And I actually saw, I, there was one unaccounted for passenger named Benno Joseph. We didn't know what happened to him, and I see a, a grave for him here at, you know, in Paramus, New Jersey, with a, with a matching date, date of birth to Benno Joseph. We knew December 16, 1994. So through the cemetery, we contacted the people playing for his perpetual care of his grave. And it was a woman, I called her and she said, oh, Benno Joseph was my father. And I said, oh, I didn't know he had another daughter. He was on the St. Louis with his wife and two daughters and they were all ended up at Auschwitz. So I assumed they were all gassed at Auschwitz. She said they were. She goes, he was really my stepfather, but I called him my father. My mother married him. She was a survivor. I, we came to America, I was a little child and she married Benno Joseph. My mother was a second Mrs. Joseph, but I, I call him my father. And um, I, I said, did he ever talk about how he survived? And she said he escaped from Auschwitz. He escaped. Now there's no record of that. We don't know, we don't know. And she said, well I could ask my mother, she's 100 years old, she's still alive. She's in the Fort Tryon uh, nursing home in Washington Heights. And she called me back a week later and she said, and I understand that she goes, I decided not to ask her after all these years. But, uh, but anyway, Benno Joseph somehow survived Auschwitz. I saw it by seeing his grave. And you know, wherever I go, this project went on for around a decade. And wherever I go, wherever I went in the country, I met people who were related to St. Louis passengers, like tonight, met Francesca. Yeah. And um, many years ago, I was speaking at the San Francisco Public Library. And um, an elderly man comes up to me and says, I was on the St. Louis. My name was Ernest Weil. And he gave me this uh, photo. And that's Ernst there, the sort of cool looking kid with the glass, with the shades, with the uh, sunglasses. I would, not, I would not have recognized him when I saw him <laughs> years later in San Francisco. And, uh, and by the way, that girl sticking her tongue out at him is his sister. Uh, the sister of that boy, Herbie, who said he'd live in Miami Beach if he ever survived. She actually, that was his sister, she actually, she was deported to Auschwitz. Um, he, we, he survived, and he said, you know, I always wanted to know what happened to my best buddy, uh, Horst Rotholz. We ended up in France together, and we were put into a children's home. 
and the children's home was raided and we were all separated. Some of the kids got caught and were deported right away and some of us ended up fleeing and our lives were saved and I, none of us know what happened to the others. And he said, everyone knew Horst because Horst always played a harmonica and he never put that harmonica down. He got it as a Hanukkah present from his parents who were not in the children's home, they were in Paris. But they thought to you know, send him a present for Hanukkah. And uh, anyway, we have this photo in our archives of children from the same children's home as Ernst and Horst. And maybe you can see which one is Horst, that second from the left. And anyway, we had to tell Ernst that Horst was deported to Auschwitz January 1943. He had gotten that harmonica for Hanukkah a month before December 1942. And Ernst sort of knew, he had a feeling that something happened to Horst, but we were able to at least give him that closure and let him know uh, what happened. And the, the stories of the St. Louis, the children on the St. Louis were just um, pretty um, <coughs> unbearable. There's a um, little infant in that, in that uh, photo, I believe, yes, um, being held. Her name was Judy. She was the youngest St. Louis passenger. She obviously doesn't remember being on board the ship, but she can remember uh, four years later being four years old, and her father in France was holding her hand, and this was all prearranged, and he was trying to get her attention. She said, Judy, look up at that, look up at the sky, it's really pretty. And her, she remembers her father's hand retreat, you know, retreating, and another hand holding her hand. She looks up, and it was a stranger. It was her rescuer. Her father arranged to have this man, non-Jewish man, take her. But they didn't want to tell her, so they just, so she never had a goodbye for her parents. Um, and Judy is still alive. She's one of the younger St. Louis passengers. She's 80 or 81. She's the youngest St. Louis passenger. She lives in Queens. We're very good friends. Um, so I'm going to conclude with this group photo here of children on the St. Louis. And just to tell you that over the course of a, uh, a decade, we were able to determine the fate of all 937 passengers on board the St. Louis. And um, the, uh, it was using all types of so I, I described some of it to you this evening. And I just want to say that much to our surprise, the majority of St. Louis passengers survived the war that was never known. But in a certain way, that doesn't um, diminish from the tragedy. In a certain way, it accentuates the tragedy in the following. Why did this particular group of Jews who got caught up in Europe end up, the, 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 the scales were tipped in favor of their survival? 